sorry. So, um, so as I was saying, there are programs, unis out there, which offers masters or postgraduate diploma. It's your personal preference, which one you want to go for. I wanted to do masters, so I applied for the masters program. And um, this, like I said, no real big difference in terms of um, pro um, career progression or, um, you know, I mean, you apply for a job. Um, just because you do masters or PhD, if you're not in any kind of disadvantage, um, but there is a real misconception about that. Um, only masters, only in masters, you have to do a dissertation, which is technically incorrect because um, they might um, term it something else, like end of um, like the end of project or something like that, and they might ask you to do a long essay instead of an actual dissertation. So they both have an element of writing, um, you know, either doing an audit or um, doing a literature review. Um, the big factor in both of it is that um, if you choose to do a master's, you do get post-grad um, loan, whereas with um, the post-grad um, the postgraduate diploma, you actually don't get any funding at all. So you will be looking into funding it um, yourself. Um, and in the next part, we'll be talking about the other things that you'll have to consider when you are um, looking into universities and applying. So um, I, if you are going straight into master's after graduating from your current degree, then you're probably looking into um, starting the course in September. Um, you can also start the course in um, January. So there's actually two intakes um, during the year which you can ap apply for. Um, I went straight into studying. Um, I have friends who um, graduated and then um, worked for a while and then um, started the course in January. So that's probably something that you need, you should keep in mind when you're looking into uni and check when they start. Um, and depending on when you start, it also affects when you qualify and I mean, when you kind of finish the course. Um, so when you do sit the national exams, you might, if you start in September, you might, um, you will be, you can try the, do the national exam in September. Or if you start in January, you might have to do the, um, national exams later on so there's actually three um you can the the pa national exams um there's three exams that happen so you can either sit the september exams or you can sit the january exams or the may exams so depending on when you finish the course you do um you then sit the national exam um, other things that you have to look for is the application deadline so i um started to apply for pa around February time, early March time, um, but they do open applications as early as September and even October. Um, so you can apply anytime. So some unis I know um, they do their interviews in, um, like they do multiple interviews throughout the year. So you don't have to, they don't just, they don't wait till everyone's applied and um, before they start doing the interview. So the early you kind of apply, you're more likely um, you'll be, you know, you'll do the interview earlier and you might even hear back from them earlier. Um, and then some unis do, um, when you, ch when you go, when you are researching unis, just um, double check if you have to apply through UCAS or if you just apply directly to the uni. Um, majority of the universities that I applied for were um, through the uni, uni itself. Um, I, I didn't have to apply for UCAS at all. But more recently, more uni universities are opting to um, make the application through UCAS. So that's something else that you should keep in mind. So in terms of um, exams, this is something that I sort of brushed over when I was thinking about what universities I wanted to apply to. Um, but it is really important to think about in order to get the most out of your university experience and make sure you're prepared for practice the best you can be, um, is to think about how the course is assessed. So are the assessments um, more academic or more practical? Are they reflective of the national exams or are they reflective of more sort of gen generic un university style exams where you're doing essays and courseworks and exams at the end of every module sort of thing. Um, at my university, we didn't have that. We had um, exams at the end of the year, which were um, SBAs and OSCEs, so very, very high fidelity to what um, the national exams are going to be like. But um, I'm sure Ikram will tell you his university does something very different where they have 
um, exams at the end of each module. So they'll do a topic and then get assessed on it. Um, there are some universities who do a lot more essay based um, assessments where they do an essay on a particular topic and then that gets assessed and goes towards your final grade. Um, this is really, really important to see whether that style will fit with you. Um, because if you're not the most academic person, maybe doing 10 courseworks in a year is not perfect for you. And maybe doing something different, which has a little bit more sort of practical assessment in course assessments is better portfolio style stuff. Um, I think the other thing to think about is the dissertation. So as Jan already said, a lot of people think that the PG dip doesn't have a dissertation, but it does. Sometimes they just call it something different. So it's important to recognize what the dissertation is and how it fits in. Um, at my university, we had to do an audit or a literature review, um, which meant that a lot of it was given to us. So we didn't particularly have a supervisor per se, as an a person we can go to to, to guide our research. Um, whereas some universities let you do your own research. Um, so it's important to understand the dissertation because that's where the majority of your marks come for for your final grade um the other thing to think about is if your university or your or the trust that you'll be working in um give you any extra qualifications so um for example ils is part of the um competency for your national exams but some universities don't offer this as, as a formal teaching opportunity they expect you to just know it um whereas some universities will actually put you through the course um Unfortunately, this does depend on sort of what your university or your trust is able to offer you. Um, it's totally possible for you to just sign on to an ILS course, which is what I did, because um, I realized that I wanted a formal qualification and I ended up just paying for it and doing it myself. Um, but yeah, um, the, next, the next thing, which is a big chunk about um, what choosing your university is about the funding, um, tuition fees is obviously the biggest thing that sort of comes in here um i can see some people have raised their hands do you want to just put it in the chat and then we can come back to it um just because i want to make sure that we get through everything um so tuition fees obviously every university sets their own tuition fees and if you actually put look look at every university you'll see the vast differences in tuition fees no one knows why this happens but because it does it's important to look if you can apply if you can afford it or not. Um, Health Education England actually give you a grant which you don't pay back, it's a bursary, which they say is for travel. Um, and it's confirmed on an annual basis and it's usually confirmed only a couple of weeks actually before um, the university starts. Um, it's usually split up into two, two and a half thousand pound um, installments. Each university decides what they want to do with it separately um and they release it how they want so some people's universities put the whole two five grand immediately into their um tuition fees so you don't have to pay that you just pay the rest some people give it to you and then you can choose what you want to do with it some people use it to subsidize um travel so they give you that money back however much of it you used and the rest of it is in is put into your um your course or whatever um or given to you as a lump at the end um, each university does it differently, so it's important to get in touch with students who are there at the moment and find out what they do. Um, and it's important to sort of plan what you're going to do with that money because that's a that's a significant chunk. Um, if you don't already have a master's, you're eligible for the postgraduate loan by student finance, which is about eleven and a half grand. I don't know the exact number because it changes every year, um, but that's only if you are. Um, eligible for it so MPAS and MSCs are eligible for it PG dips are not and that's a big factor for people not doing PG dips um, some universities offer sponsorships so there are some universities um, I think one or two down south and then um, a good chunk of the ones in Wales which offer a spons spons sponsorship um, which means that they will pay your tuition fees and or give you a maintenance loan or a maintenance grant um, for you to work in their trust for a certain number of, of months or years. Um, 
this was this is important to get the if you are applying for one of these universities it's important to work out exactly what the conditions of the sponsorship are because it was a big sticking point for a lot of people during um covid when they weren't able to find uh jobs in that region because of the pressures of covid um so it's important to work out exactly how many months do i need to work for you before i can get a job elsewhere and i'm not expected to pay everything back again um think about other equipment you need to buy so the most common thing is that a lot of people buy a stethoscope which usually costs about 100 pounds um some universities if they're well stocked and they have a good number of resources might be able to lease you a stethoscope um or other equipment that you might want like tendon hammers um or ophthalmoscopes um and this is really really important that you don't buy your own because if you're using it only once or twice a week you can just rent it out um, from the university for free um, and then also think about if you are going to struggle with the finances if you are thinking about a part-time job is that going to be compatible with the contact hours you have a nine to five university schedule with a nine to five part-time job is not going to work if you have a saturday job does that give you enough time to chill um, it's important to think about these sorts of things and seeing if all of it balances up especially when you get into second year and everything's placement. Um, I'm sure someone will talk about um, jobs and stuff later on, though. Um, the next thing I want to talk to you about was the competition of um, each university. So universities are becoming increasingly competitive as people find out more and more about the PA course, which is why all of you guys are here. Um, some universities have employed the UCAT. To my knowledge, the only university that does this at the moment is, is St. George's. Um, they don't have a UCAT cutoff, but they are expecting everyone for September 2022 entry to have a UCAT um, and to rank in the top something of their cohort. Um, so it's important to recognize that it is really competitive and it's getting more competitive per intake. Um, you're expected to have a personal statement which is focused to PA. Um, there isn't usually a, a word limit on this, although usually um, the ones that apply through UCAS are subject to all of the UCAS um, regulations that they have. Um, you're usually expected to go to an interview. Um, also think about the other healthcare professionals that are going to be on placement with you. Um, so if you have a medical school at the same university, you're going to be sharing a lot of resources with them, which may or may not be a good thing. Um, same thing with nursing students, pharmacists. Um, and that's that's really important to think about as well. Um, I'll pass on to Ikram. Uh, so in terms of the application process itself, uh... each university has uh, different entry requirements, for example, like the generic entry requirements might be they, they require a 2-2 two, two from an undergrad degree, but they'll also require some healthcare experience. So, for example, you might have to do specific uh, hours where in a clinical setting, for example, but it's not, it's not always a clinical setting. So you might be doing some helping in a charity or somewhere which you can transfer your skills into the clinical settings. Uh, yeah, so each uni has that. For example, the universities I went, uh, I applied to, so I'm going to Bradford at the moment, they wanted a 2-1 undergrad, and they also wanted a healthcare background. Um, uh, alongside that, they also, uh, also wanted personal statement and referees. So you have to consider these ones uh, when you're trying to apply. So the best way I found was I made a table with all the different universities that I want to attend or possible looking into attending. And then I made a, the table. In the table, there was like grades they require, uh, any backgrounds they require, if there's funding for it, if there's not. So through there, I was able to use a traffic light system. So for example, green, which was, I'm able to apply to this. Uh, I've got the grades. I've got everything that's needed at the moment. Yellow, I might need to do something in the future, for example, and I might need to contact my referee and see if they happy to do a ref, uh, become my reference. So through this, I was able to uh, just take my units that I can apply to. So for example, uh, one of my key criteria was I want to commute to units instead of staying out. So I 
uh, through this, I was able to target specific universities. So through this, uh, different universities have different criteria. So some, like for example, Manchester, they require a mini CV where they give you a few questions and you have to uh, answer those questions and give examples. For example, uh, it might be something to do with motivation or where you work as uh, a team. And you have to give an example on how you can relate it to clinical environments. Or the universities uh, ask for a generic personal statement where you just explain why you're, you'll be good for the course or why you'll be a good student. Uh, you'll have to, you'll need uh, your qualifications, that's a must. So you need to have uh, copies of your qualification and you need, I think, two referees per application. So for example, I gave one of my line manager and then I gave an academic tutor, but you can also give your clinical tutor or someone that will be able to be at least three years, I think is. And then you need a transcript of your undergraduate studies. I think it has to be the degree certificate itself. I don't think it can be a copy. Yeah, moving on to the next slide. So in terms of the interview, uh, different because of COVID, a lot of the interviews were online. Some were MMI and some were just a general panel. Uh, so for example, my Bradford interview was uh, done by two, two people, whereas uh, Leeds and other universities were done as an MMI style where you uh, in a group and then they put you into different chat rooms and you answer the questions. Uh, majority of the interview questions there involve ethical questions. So they are like medical interviews. So what would you do if you saw this? What would you do if you saw someone cheating? How would you react to this? Uh, so yeah, you'll have to, uh, the best sources I found for interviews were speaking to PAs or students at the moment through in Instagram and uh, YouTube as well as a good source where you can look at medical uh, students and see what kind of questions and tips they give because we're all basically, because we use the medical model, we can relate to that stuff. Uh, so because of COVID, I don't, I don't think we, uh, we did any group exercises or any essays, but like I said, the CV is a mini essay English test that you do. But some, uh, one of the units that caught me off by chance was Leeds, where they gave, uh, once you've applied and were successful with the application, they gave us a questionnaire to do, a personality questionnaire to do. And I don't think that was written on the Leeds requirement itself, but it might be due to the uh, participants that have applied for the course. So just be wary of the different kind of uh, entry requirements that are for different unis. Uh, yeah, so like uh, the panel of uh, the panel for the universities consists of clinicians itself, lecturers, and student PAs. So just be careful and just be just research a lot of medical questions, like the common questions: why PA? Uh, why do you think you'll be a good student? Uh, ethics, make sure you go over your ethical questions. So just have a generic understanding of your ethical questions. And uh, I think for one of the unis, I went over my anatomy as well, because they asked me some anatomy questions, but it wasn't anything deeply, it was just basic anatomy questions. That I'm sure most of you will know anyway. Next slide. Uh, so in terms of funding, so it depends, like uh, my colleague said, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you do a PG dip, the, the master's postgraduate loan is not available to you. So I'm doing a master's, so I was able to get the postgraduate loan. And I think it's 11 and a half thousand. That's equally split over two years. And then the rest of the sum, you have to fund it yourself. And that could be either you use the HEE bursary over two years, or you could use maybe a part-time job that you have that can support this family funding, or maybe you can get a private sponsorship. Or there's, I think, scholarships as well. I found one website, but uh, they have their own entry requirements. So you'll have to look into that for how you can get that. But I know some people, depending on your circumstances and ages and background, you can get bank loans. For example, I couldn't get a bank loan because of my age. Uh, so what I've done is I've got a master's graduate loan and HE bursary. But I, I took a gap year after my undergrad to fund it. So I worked for a year, got some saving, and then this is how I'm paying for it. But I'm also currently working, so you might be able to get like a Saturday job. But like my colleague said, you have to take into consideration, do you have enough time to revise, chill? stuff like that. So I think it's all a lot about management and having your time organized. 
Next. So in terms of uh, the course preparation, uh, there's, for, for example, for me, because I'm a first year student, I, I only, the most preparation I did was for the interview and the application process itself. So I took my annual leave from my work to prepare for my interviews and stuff like this. But just, I think, just make the most of your time before, because like, like you might have noticed, it's an intense course, it's two years, not a lot of holidays. So just make sure you spend a lot of time with your family, friends, just these stress at all times. I think my colleagues will speak to you a bit more about Okay, so I'll be just covering what we do in Newcastle Uni and how, I think predominantly this is how it is structured in the majority of the university. So um, in year one, that's where you um, learn all your clinical skills. Um, so at Newcastle, the first six weeks were predominantly where we just get taught how to do a cardiac examination, how to do a respiratory examination. So you kind of have the basis of everything. And then we start like the blocks of teaching. So you cover every system head to toe, a bit of oncology and everything. Um, so it's really, really heavy on theory the first year. Um, and also it's really, really, um, you have to be responsible for your own learning. Um, it's a lot of self-directed learning and there's no one you know, um, behind your back telling you to do this, do that. There's none of that. Um, you really, really do have to take responsibility. There is a lot of content to cover and the unit doesn't actually have enough time to cover all the content. So um, there is a matrix for PA. If you type in on, in Google um, ma um, PA matrix, it'll list out all the conditions that we are expected to know how to treat and manage and stuff like that. Um, so it's your responsibility to cover that at, in your own time. You also do get lectures. So you, you have to be in lectures and then you, um, you know, do things that's not covered in, in your lectures in your own time. Um, first year, we predominantly focused on, um, you know, coming to the right diagnosis and the kind of investigations you would then carry out. Um, but it, it's about working on your clinical skills to get to the correct diagnosis. Um, and then I think year two is more so for the management side of things. But me, I personally, in year one, um, wanted to make sure that my skills were, you know, per not perfect, but my skills were up to, you know, up to scratch and that I could come to a um, few different, like a few um, diagnoses. Um, we also had <clears throat> placement as well. So we had like um, every Monday we were in a GP practice. Um, you know, it's not because of COVID, we couldn't see patients, but we were, you know, consulting them through the phone. Um, we would, if there was any blood clinic on, we would try and um, practice taking bloods. Um, and then towards the end of year one, we had a five week um, block five week um, block of placements where we are actually at the hospital um, in secondary care and then depending on the trust you're either in one department for the entire five weeks or you get to rotate so I was um, fortunate enough to rotate during my um, five weeks I was with Durham and Darlington Trust um, so at, um, so at, in each week I was in different department um, and there's a lot of traveling. <laughs> so just you get tired. I mean, I have to travel quite a bit to get to, um, to, to Darlington. So you have all this stuff to revise for, you know, the exams, uh, um, the exams, the placement um, and the travel just doesn't help, but um, it's there. Um, and that's year one. Um, and then we move on to year two. And this is where you put everything that you've learned into practice. Um, so September till up until I think mid-May, we are on rotations. Um, and there's like a block for each rotation. So, you know, um, emergency care and like um, community medicine, and you just rotate and you learn, you put, put everything you've learned into practice. Um, at Newcastle, like, there's no real teaching. No, we don't have lectures anymore. Um, it's about revising for the exams. And then Monday to Friday, instead of lectures, you're on placement nine to five or um, earlier. It depends on when the um, um, when the ward um, starts, like the, um, the day starts at the ward. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's a lot of coming, you, you know, you travel to placement, you do your day at placement and then you travel back and then you kind of have a mini break somewhere in between and then you have to, you know, start focusing on your dissertation or start revising for the exams. Um, I would, I have 
a job as a um, bank healthcare assistant and I haven't been able to work. I just feel like doing Monday to Friday at the hospital itself is very tiring. Um, so I haven't been able to pick up any shifts, um, but I did save up before I started the course. So um, it's that's something that you need to um, think about as well. It's like you would be physically tired as well as mentally drained from everything that you kind of learn and absorb while you're in um, placement. Next slide. So moving on to placements and how to get the most out of them. Placements are different for different people because everyone has a different experience with placements and then everyone's placement opportunities are different. So there's no like one solution for everyone. But I think the important thing to remember is that you can get burnt out and you can get burnt out fast. I was someone who was very naive about burnout. I was like, no, nah, I'll be fine. I made it through year one. I've done an entire undergraduate degree. I'm pretty good with my time management and I burnt out in three weeks um, and when you hit that sort of roadblock it is really difficult to get past it so it's recognizing that it's 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 going to happen at some point it's about putting in the management strategies to curb it or to minimize it um, I didn't realize this when I was on placement but a lot of knowledge is just absorbed when you hear people talking medically all of the time you start talking medically and you just absorb things that just happen around you. If you hear something enough times or you see something enough times, you will memorize it. And that doesn't that doesn't require learning. I thought that I would have to learn how to do a ward round. I don't. I just copied someone and I've seen it enough times to do a ward round now. I can I can do it. Um, and that's something that I didn't realize. I didn't realize that I don't have to be doing a clinical skill. I don't need someone to teach me and watch me do something. I just need to do it. Um, I found it really useful to create a plan for every day, every week and every rotation. So have a target I want to achieve that day. So when I walk in and I introduce myself to the team, I'm gonna be like, I wanna take three bloods today. I wanna do an ABG. I wanna take a history from this patient. I want to go to an on-call. I want to see a cardiac arrest. And sometimes these plans are achievable and sometimes they're not but the fact that you've got a plan is better than no plan at all so you're not just drifting around on the ward um it also meant that when i met up with supervisors i could show them that i had a plan i got these things ticked off and i have these things to tick off as well um it also gives you a little bit of direction for when those days are like really dragging on placement i'm sure i'm sure diana will be able to tell you as well and any anyone who's who's been on placement for a while um you get to a point in the afternoon where nothing's really happening people have jobs to do and you feel like an extra piece and you don't really know what to do and you're standing there watching people fill out a discharge summary and you're like i don't know what to do i want to do something but i can't and at this point it's really good to sort of have that list and be like right well what i wanted to do this rotation is go to a clinic well actually right now nothing's happening on the ward let me go to a clinic and you can ask someone and just say are there any clinics happening right now and 80% of the time there is, and you just go to it. No one's going to be keeping track of you as so long as someone knows you're doing something productive. Equally, if you've had a really, really good day at placement and you've achieved loads of stuff, and now it looks like actually you're getting in the way of people because you've done everything you wanted to do, you're doing things extra, people have their own jobs to do, go home. Um, if you've achieved what you wanted to achieve that day, go home. It doesn't, if your hours aren't, if you've got your hours and you've got what you need to get out of it, so long as your supervisor agrees, just go home and get out of the way and go home, relax or revise or do something else. Um, that was something that I found really, really useful on placement. The, the next thing I want to talk about is these three words that keep getting thrown about when people talk about placements. It's about being enthusiastic, proactive and, in, and using your initiative. It's a lot easier said than done. If you have no interest in a specialty, which I'll be honest, a lot of the times I didn't, I would find it really hard to fake that enthusiasm and get the most out of placement. If I don't want to be here because I'm not interested in something, it's really hard to stay engaged. So what I did instead was go back to that plan and find something that I can do that is generic or not particular to that specialty or find a question that I don't quite understand about that specialty. Go find that consultant who's an expert at it and ask them about it because people will teach you if they think that you're interested in it and actually interest doesn't have to be a personal interest it can be an interest for your exam or for your dissertation or an essay or just to understand how something works 
Um, and that's really, really important, I think, to do, which I don't think that I did enough um, while I was on placement. One thing that I found really, really useful, and this is probably because I just got really, really horrible experiences right at the beginning of my placement, is I started doing daily reflections. So on my way home, I would reflect on a thing that happened. Um, just in my head, with my headphones on, listening to music, I would think about something that surprised me, that was good, that was bad, that I wasn't expecting, and think about how I would have reacted in that situation, and then how the healthcare professional I was shadowing, um, or I was attached to, reacted in that situation. And it was never sort of formal, and I didn't write it down or anything like that. But just to go through that process in your head meant that the next time that that happened, I was a little bit more aware of my actions. Um, it also really helped to sort of curb that burnout that I was talking about, where something bad had happened and you'd feel exhausted. And just to run through it in your mind, on your own, when you're relaxed, not distracted, actually helped a lot to sort of understand how I felt about things and to move forward with it um so I found reflection really useful the other thing which I also didn't do very much of on placement was to make the most of other healthcare professionals just because we're PAs doesn't mean we only stay with PAs or we only stay with doctors I learned so much from nurses from speech and language therapists from physiotherapists from occupational therapists from mental health nurses that were just visiting the ward from sisters from matrons from clinical directors that were just hanging about um Anyone and everyone can teach you something, and that's really, really important to recognize. Um, I spent a day with a dietitian when I was on um, neuro, which I didn't expect to do, but you understand how all parts of someone's, how the entire MDT fit together, which helps when you're trying to make a plan for a patient in, in practice, and you're like, well, we need to address X, Y, and Z, but I can't do all of that. Actually, you know what? The speech and language therapist can do this and I can get in touch with a care coordinator to do this. Um, and it makes your life a lot more easier if you know what other people's jobs are and you call them in for their bit because they're passionate about their sector and we're passionate about ours. We can't do everything. Um, and then the last thing is if something isn't working, find another way. So if you're finding that actually going to the ward round every day in the morning is not actually that beneficial for your work, find something else, speak to your supervisor, say, look, I don't think the ward round is helpful to me. I've seen it this many times. Can I come in a little bit later, maybe stay a little bit later and see how the night shift um, handover happens or go to clinic or I don't really like clinic. Can I go on and do an on-call? I found that I didn't really like um, to hang about on the ward too much, um, especially sort of on like surgery, for example, where a lot of things happen in the morning and then the rest of the day, there isn't very much that happens. Um, I found that in the mornings I would stay with the ward team and then in the afternoons I would go off with whoever's got the on-call bleep and start going with people to review patients in A&E or, or anywhere else. Um, and that was really, really good for my learning, I thought. Um, but it's about working out what's good for you. And if, the, if this isn't working, something else is happening, it's a hospital there are other things happening, go find something else that's more useful to you. Um, so that's what I thought was useful to my placements and what the advice I would give for placements. Um, in terms of after you've done your exams um, and your dissertation and portfolio and all your university stuff, um, you're required to sit the PA national exam. So you are required to pass in order to qualify and practice as a physician associate. Um, at the moment, the exams are two two hour exams, which are single best answer. So you have a question and then five multiple choice quest answers um, and you choose the one that fits the best. So all of them could be right or one of them could be right. It doesn't really matter. Um, and at the moment, they are online, which makes it a lot better because I can do it from my bed. Um, I found that a lot less stressful than going to an exam center, if I'm completely honest. Um, and then you do a 14 station OSCE, which is um, clinical scenarios, which are expected to act out or role play. Um, and they can be from anywhere about consultation skills. So taking a history or examining someone to explaining a procedure or a medication or a blood result or dealing with an emergency situation um, to anything else that you might be expected to do as a physician associate um like a clinical skill 
Um, and that's, that usually happens over a period of about one or two months. Um, at the moment, I think it's about six weeks, the entire process from sitting the SBAs to the last person sitting OSCEs, um, or maybe four weeks, something like that. Um, and the thing that I probably didn't budget for when I started the course was um, recognizing how many things I need to pay for after I've done all of this. So the pain has its own fees um, and they're not cheap. Um, I didn't budget for them because I thought, yeah, well, I can do it after my exams. Well, no, these are my exams. Um, so, so to think about how much they are and then to think about how much the managed voluntary register costs and to budget that into your um, initial funding part of your um, university choice. Um, because without going on the NBR, a lot of, a lot of employers won't take you. And um, now more than ever, it's important to be on the NBR with us going on to um, GMC regulation next year. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is jobs. So as PAs, we can work anywhere and everywhere. I think about more than half of people work in secondary care, about a third of people work in general practice. Um, a lot of PAs work in like really, really sub specialisms um, because we have that generalist knowledge. You can apply to jobs whenever. Um, a lot of people, or at least my experience at the moment is that a lot of people will interview you and give you a verbal offer, but it's conditional on you passing the pain. Um, and just from talking to friends and stuff, no one's really had any um, anything start with their job until after they pass the pain. Um, a lot of big employers do this, so big, big healthcare trusts who have loads of PAs in the system already. Um, but yeah, jobs is really exciting. You can apply to jobs whenever you want. I probably started uh, sort of in summer. So I'll, I'll be qualifying in November. So I started in summer. Um, I got rejected from loads of jobs uh, right away because I just wasn't qualified. And I'm still getting rejected from jobs because I'm not qualified. But there's no rush because I've got plenty of weeks. Um, and even after that, if I was to apply to a job after I get my pass, I probably stand a better chance because I can start working tomorrow. Um, and the whole HR process takes so long that I probably start at the same time as my colleagues who have already got jobs, they've been given a job offer, but they haven't started the HR process because they need to wait until they pass. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically a quick whiz through the entire PA journey. I'm aware that we've been super, super um, speedy with it, um, but I've got a few top tips that we've accrued from our collective knowledge, if you can call it that. Um, Diana. Yeah, so I think the number one top tip from my personal experience is um, make most of your holidays. I think that's the number one tip. Um, because once you start the course, it is super intense. Like no one is kidding when they say this is harsh and this is hard because it really, really is really intense. Um, I think Pooja kind of touched on it, touched on it when she said, if one thing isn't working for you, try something else. And you can actually apply that to the resources that you're using as well. So if you sit there, you know, you're, you're using one particular website and it, it doesn't make sense, um, use another website or use another book. Um, what you do have to keep in mind is if you are using books, um, they're not often up to date, or you might buy a book right now and it might be the most up to date book out right now. But the management, the, you know, the treatment, the treatment changes, the management changes so often. So it's probably better, you're probably better off buying a book that's quite generic. So if it's like clinical skills, you know, a cardiovascular examination is going to be pretty standard all across um, the globe, really. Um, so my, buy a book that kind of covers clinical skills, but I wouldn't necessarily advise or suggest you buy a book um, with you know the treatment and the management of diseases because it's you know one um, soon it might be not um, up to date and when we are doing when we are sitting the national exam or even the university exam exams and um, they ask you questions um, if it's treatment questions obviously they'll ask you questions and they write the exams a um, few weeks prior to us sitting the exam itself so the answers would be um, 
different to um so let's say um, what i'm trying to get is if you if you are sitting the exam in may and you're using a book that's published in september the management would have changed so just use different resources be mindful of which resources are that um which resources you are using um and double check that you know it is up, the most up to date um information it's also quite um quite beneficial if you have a good support system at home um you know your family your friends let them know that you know you've heard others tell you that it's quite intense and um, you will cry <laughs> here and there um, and i have <laughs> i'm speaking from experience i've cried almost every week <laughs> um, and but it's okay you know you have to trust the process it is a two-year course um you're not expected to know it all even when you graduate when um, i'm with the junior doctors they don't know half like you know, they don't know everything that they're doing you do have lead consultants um nearby that who, who you can always ask questions to and they'll guide you so there's no real um push to know everything and um, if you if you ever don't know anything the best quest the best thing to do is ask and um, they're always 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 happy to teach you at the hospital um, and yeah you just have to trust the process you'll feel like you don't know anything but then when a patient is in front of you and you're asked to do something um, you will do it and um, even if you get it wrong the first time around the second time around you won't because you've learned from the first time around um, and you will you'll easily just absorb everything um and then practice questions as well that's one thing I, I would suggest you do so yeah um have a good support system and then use resources but be really really mindful of the resources that you're using um and any time off before joining the course um do less prep work and more time outdoors um you know going for meals going on holidays whatever it is that you enjoy doing do it because once the course starts you'll find yourself sitting at the um, study de study desk um you know from day to night so yeah that's what I, I would tell you guys yeah so i had a few top tips as well and i don't know if diana has found it useful but when i started the course i found it very difficult to get on top of everything all at once if you look at the matrix there's like 30 odd conditions for cardiovascular um and you have your x number of weeks to cover it and it just physically isn't possible even if you spent a day on each condition um to write write your notes understand it and actually learn it um so i found it useful to make a study group so in my study group there was five or six of us um and we looked at our our cardiovascular list and split up between us and we said right you do this many i do this many and then we share notes and we teach each other um we found that really helped um it took a little bit of time to find our feet into a, how much depth we all wanted to go into um writing things in a way that everyone could understand them teaching things in a way that everyone could understand them um but splitting the workload was really really helpful um we also did a lot of um like studies study sessions with each other so if someone really understood something and no one else did they would literally make a lesson on it and teach it to us like one week one evening over zoom um which we found really useful because it's someone that you're not scared to ask questions to. You're not scared to look like a fool in front of them because they're your friend. Um, but we found that really, really helped. Um, also, ace your introduction. So it took me ages to say physician associate without tripping over my words. So ace your, hi, my name is Pooja. I'm a physician associate student. And ace what a physician associate student is. So what is going to be your little blurb that you're going to tell that nurse who comes up to you and says, what are you doing on my ward? And you can actually tell them what you were here for, why you're here, how long you're here for, what doctor you're shadowing, what you're trying to get out of your day, what a physician associate is, and give them all of the answers that they want without tripping up and looking like a fool. Because I've done that plenty of times. Um, also, something I did quite late on in my, in my like PA journey was to sign up to the FPA the Royal College of Physicians and the GMC um, and just just sign up as like a I want to know more about it pass into the GMC and the RCP and then sign up to be a student PA member um, just because a lot of information is shared through that membership email a lot of information about exams placements COVID had massive implications on a lot of people um, 
and this wasn't this wasn't communicated through universities until very very late on and everyone was in a panic but it came through the fpa a lot sooner um so i would say that's a definite thing to do and then the gmc who will have um have a a link that you can sign up to the medical associate professionals or something it's called the maps um where they're going to release information about how to sign up to their regulation um information stuff um, and then the RCP usually just have loads of free webinars that you can watch, which are really, really good because they're usually very interesting. And a lot of people that deliver them are like experts in their field. So they are really approachable and they usually give their email out at the end of it or some social media that you can contact them on to ask them more questions. And like I said, it's about making the most out of all the people that are there for you to make the most out of. Um, and this includes people who you don't necessarily have direct contact with. Um, yeah, but those are my top tips. So do we, so this is, this is the feedback link of that QR code. We would be very, very happy if you feel, filled it out for us. Um, I'll also post it in the chat, but thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for coming to our, our webinar. Um, I hope it's been okay. I see that there's loads of questions, so I'll I'll go through them now. Um, so, are you given a checklist to tick things off at placement, Diana? You can answer this one. Um, yes, but you are given a checklist to tick off, but that's quite um that's dependent on your uni. So each uni will have um their own set of checklist um that you need to tick off. Um, yeah, but yeah, you will be given um, certain, um, certain competencies that you do need to get signed off. Um, if not, you won't be able to qualify from the uni. Yep. Yeah. Um, and like you said, the pain fee at the moment is 790 um, for uh, that's combined for the OSCE and the um, written component. Um, it changes year on year, but these are the these are the fee figures up until the next couple of years. Um, and I'm sure that they'll they'll provide more guidance as things change in the future. Uh, hopefully not too much more than that, because it's already very expensive. Um, we've got another question saying, are there any particular reasons for applying to be a physician associate instead of a physician? So do you two both want to go through like your motivations of why you wanted to become a PA instead of go down the medicine route? Uh, so in terms of PA, and I think the uh, main difference is like, especially depending on everyone's circumstances, is time of studying as well. So for me, like the PA, I wanted a generalist understanding. I didn't want to specialize into anything because it is a massive time commitment. Because, uh, for example, if I didn't know what I want to specialize into, and if I chose the wrong specialty, I'm wasting a bit of time, then I have to choose something else. But with PA, uh, after the two years, you're basically, you can go into any specialty you want, and then six months down the line, you can change, for example, go into a &E for six months, see how it is, you might like it, you might stay with it, if you don't like it, you might go to a ward, a specialist ward like uh, endoscopy, or you might want to go into mental health or GP instead, so uh, main factors were stuff like that, and I think uh, it just it's very flexible. So for me, like family life and stuff like that, and out of hours, I want like a nine to five kind of job and have the weekend to myself. With medicine, you don't really get that. You're a bit, you do nights one week, you're doing long days the other. So I think it's the flexibility and overall ability to go into different specialties and not having the commitment. So yeah, Diana, do you want to explain why you done it? Um, yeah, so again, just like Ikram mentioned, it's the versatility and the flexibility that's kind of drawn me into this um, course. And also the funding as well. I think if you're um, doing medicine as a postgraduate, you actually need to save up more. Um, and whereas with PA, it's, I only had to save up, save up for two years. Um, and again, I'm one of those people who, you know, I want to do a bit of neuro, I want to do a bit of ops and gynecology. Um, I've done a bit of cardiac kind of, you know, I've done three years of cardiac and I've kind of, I realized that I don't want to be necessarily stuck in just one field. Um, so this, this role allows me to kind of jump or hop around um, different fields. Um, and then again, it's a different lifestyle, I guess. Um, I can have the family life that I want. Um, yeah, they were my reasons. 
I think Larry, someone's been, sorry, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Someone's go ahead. mentioned in the Q&A, so when applying through UCAS, will it be only one personal statement for all unis? Or will it need to be a personal statement direct? So at the moment, I think through UCAS, there's only one specific university that's doing it through UCAS. But this may change in the future because of so, how competitive it is. Sorry, there's, there's, there's a few universities that apply through UCAS. I think it's about yeah. so universities um, and it is increasing. Um, but no, you are correct that um, you do only have one um, one personal statement that gets sent to all of them. And you can only apply to a maximum of five through UCAS. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, if you apply directly to universities, um, you can send them an individual personal statement. Um, but through UCAS, you have to have the same personal statement for everyone. Yeah, so the best way for, especially when you're applying through directly through the university, is go on to the university website and see what kind of teaching they do, uh, what funding they have, or what kind of criteria they're looking at it and make sure you sort of subtly mention it in your personal statement. So like, for example, they might do PBL and you previously have done PBL, so problem-based learning. It's one of the teaching styles. So mention that you've had previous knowledge of uh, PBL and give an example, for example, and uh, mention how this approach, uh, the university teaching suits your learning style and how it will be beneficial for you. So stuff like this, you can basically tailor your personal statement to the specific universities uh, when applying directly to, to, to them. So the next question says, how much experience is a good point to begin thinking of applying? I don't think there's a, I would number to this. It's just when you have a realistic understanding of what you want to do or the career you want to go into and when you feel comfortable with it. So you just get a whole like, range of experience, I think. So for example, I had my undergraduate experience where I was student for three years. And I, as a radiographer, got to witness the whole scene of the hospital. So I knew like what I'm going into. But you can also do work in a care home and see the care element to it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in a hospital. It could be care home or other care. So you might do community work, for example. So there's no set number or set limit to it. There's, uh, I think sometimes they might ask for it, but you have to check. I think if you're out for a long time from education, then they ask for a specific uh, hours, but just check on the university websites and um, yeah so a lot of yeah sorry a lot of a lot of universities don't specify how much experience is enough some universities will say that um they want this many hours and you have to document them um and have a referee to back that up um i think i agree with what ikram said is that it, it just depends on how much you feel comfortable with um i think it's more about the quality of that experience and the quantity um i don't know if both of you agree, but I think shadowing a PA for a week is probably better than being a healthcare assistant for two years because you're seeing something directly on the job um, and exactly what, what the job is in terms of insight, I suppose. It's not so much about the sort of... I think, I think it's important to recognise there are two things you can get out of work experience. You get skills work experience you get insight skills you can learn from any job it doesn't have to be pa it doesn't have to be healthcare assistant it doesn't have to be radiographer it doesn't have to be whatever um you can work as a barista and get all the same skills probably um but the important thing about work experience is that you want to get that insight into what is a pa going to do and you need to be in a role that you can see how a pa fits into that team um, and that's usually why people do shadowing and things because they get sort of backseat insight into what they're doing. If you're working in a role, you end up sort of seeing that team from your role's perspective as opposed to seeing it from a backseat and going, right, this is the team. How does a position associate fit? Um, and that's usually where shadowing helps. I don't think there is a specific number. I think whatever you feel comfortable with, and so long as the university doesn't. Um, specify how much work experience hours you need um yeah can i so, just add on to that yeah. i just want to say like no matter how much experienced you are or how many, like, how many experience you've got 
I don't think anything can prepare you for the first cardiac arrest you see or the second cardiac arrest you see. I think every day is a new day. And um, I personally wasn't the most confident person um, when I was applying for this course. You just have to apply and you really do have to trust the process and you will overcome your fears and you really will I mean, surprise yourself with um, what you do. So I'd, again, um, I, um, I second what um, both Pooja and Ikram said, like you don't necessarily need hours and hours of experience, it's the quality. And um, if you think you're ready for it, just go for it. So the next question says, uh, when you travel, will you have to travel to and back from the placement every day or are you given accommodation for it? Diana, do you wanna answer this? Um, so as far as I'm aware, the hospital doesn't give you the accommodation, so it's your responsibility. In fact, I think when they do the interview, when the uni does the interview, they do make it quite clear to you that they cover so many miles and so and so. So when you then accept the offer, you are um, somehow in one way or another agreeing to travel and that you've kind of agreed to say you're willing to travel this far. Um, so it's up to you whether um so i had a few of my friends um during the first year because we weren't on placement for very long and they stayed at home and then for the second year because of our, we, we were on rotation monday to friday they then moved out to be somewhere near the hospital so that they don't have to necessarily travel um with me i don't think i need to uh, move out and um, whether i move out or stay home i don't think it, it doesn't make a massive difference um to me so um yeah the host but the hospital won't cover your accommodation um, and it's up to you whether you want to travel backwards or forwards um so yeah. at, at my university at my hospital trust so my trust was um a good 50-ish miles away probably more than that than from university so in first year i lived near university and then second year i moved out to live near my hospital um my hospital did have accommodation available for medical students, which we could tap into um, because of whatever reason, I chose not to do that. And I got my own sort of accommodation, private accommodation near the hospital. Um, but some hospitals do offer it. Um, and I'm right in thinking that some universities have um, partnerships with accommodation services in other trusts, um, especially if they're particularly far away. I give you a subsidy on the accommodation you still have to pay a, sub a significant amount for it but it's just not 800 pounds a month or whatever it would have been if you weren't a student um but yeah a lot of a lot of people do do quite a considerable amount of traveling for placement i think that's important to recognize that it is difficult to travel to placement and that's a big big part of placement placement life is traveling um, the next question is, how is this career different to careers like medicine and nursing? Who wants to talk about that? Uh, so I think we touched base on it with the first question we answered. So it depends what you're trying to get out of your career itself. So, for example, like I said, with medicine, you need to, after you've done your undergrad, you need to, you've done your course training and stuff, you need to choose a specialty you want to specialise into. And I think it's the same with nursing, like, once you're a nurse, there's the ladder to go up to become like an advanced nurse, nursing, uh, advanced nurse practitioner. But with uh, PAs, you're a generalist. So you have a general understanding of each specialty. And then you can, you, you don't specialize into anything. You can do six months of this uh, GP, for example, general practice, six months in A&E. So that's the main difference. You don't have to specialize. But we do work like uh, using the medical model, whereas the nurses use the nursing model. So the uh, models we use in studying is different to nursing, but it's the same for what the doctors use. That's the main difference. But I think it depends on what you want from your career or education, and then you tailor it or choose it to yourself. Does anyone else want to add to that? No, I just want to say that's a very good explanation. So. That is the biggest difference between us and doctors is that we don't specialize and although we upskill in terms of we become a PA working in gastroenterology who can do endoscopies and who can do X, Y and Z, we stay a PA. So in theory, we can be picked up from anywhere and plopped anywhere and we should still be able to function as a PA, um, which I don't think you get with many other many other healthcare professions. Um, 
even roles like GPs seem very generalist, but are very, very specialized in the sense that it's very community based and red flags and stuff. Um, and I think that is, that is a big difference. The, the differences between us and nursing is that we focus on the medical model, um, but we also have a lot more um, involvement in the diagnosis, investigation, management of a condition. Whereas um, I think I'm right in saying, and I don't want to generalize, um, but nursing care is usually a little bit more about the here and now. And now that we've diagnosed it, let's deal with it. Um, I think that's that's a big that's a big difference. Um, Dana, is there anything you wanted to add? No, I think you guys covered all the bases. <laughs> yeah, Great. I think the way, the way that I introduce myself and I'm walking toward is I tend to say that we bridge the gap between the doctors and the nurses. That's what I tend to say, and that seems to be working. And then you do get the odd um, nurse asking you, then how do you differ from an, a nurse pr practitioner? And then I, then that's what I bring um, when I bring in how we are, you know, we study we study the medical model, whereas the nurses study the nursing um, model. Um, but that's what I usually how I phrase um, our role. We bridge the gap between the doctors and the nurses. Us and AMPs is that AMPs train in a specific specialty. So it would be an AMP in urology, whereas we are a PA who works in urology. Um, AMPs can't be picked up from one specialty and dropped in another one. That's not how they work. They have, although their training is very generalist, their placement is very specialist and therefore they develop the skills for that profession for that specialty exclusively um and although they do have a massive um a massive skill set and stuff and, and there is a lot of overlap in that we do have a different role within the mdt compared to them i think um so yeah i think it is very complicated to explain in in short but um, we have a few blog posts on our website, futurefrontline.co.uk, which has um, some really good explanations of how physician associates fit into the workforce, um, what made us want to become physician associates and, and big misconceptions and stuff. So it's, it's really worth checking that out if you wanted to find out a bit more. And obviously we're all reachable on, on emails and stuff. So shoot us a message. Um, I miss. Sorry, I I just missed the part about the GMC. What's the membership called? So if you um, if you go on to if you write in GMC NAP regulation, um, it should bring up a page where it says you can sign up for updates and just sign up for it, and you get an an email every couple of months or something which tells you where they're at with it. Um, and it is really good because that's probably where everyone's going to find things out fast. So yeah, um. There's another question about GMC regulation. What will GMC regulation mean for new qualified PAs? So it's it's difficult to say exactly what it'll cover when we don't know exactly what it'll cover yet. Um, all of this is still being worked out, but for the most part, it's about regulation. So it's about holding PAs accountable and having a standard that is set across the board. At the moment, the Royal College of Physicians doesn't do that in the same way that the GMC does for doctors. And um, although it's advised that we have the same standards, like same standards for practice and stuff as doctors, it's not set in stone. So this is obviously um, really important to get done. Um, it also means better, better understanding of what physician associates are, a little bit more awareness of physician associates, um, a, bit, a little bit more sort of recognition of our role as, as part of the MDT, I suppose. Um, the big thing about regulation is that it's the first step to loads of other things happening, such as more clear progression, um, prescribing rights, if that comes. Um, so really, regulation is only is a big step, but it's the first step to a lot of other things happening. I hope that I think sense. we forgot to mention in the major differences was uh, PAs can't prescribe, nor can they request x-rays. Yes. So uh, the GMC regulation will be like a step towards that. Hopefully we can prescribe. Like nursing can give basic medis medications, like emergency med medications, but PAs at the moment, they can't give medication. And or can they request x-rays or CT scans or MR we can, scans? We can, give, we can give medications in emergency situations. Yeah, yeah. So if, if, if there is an emergency and someone needs an EpiPen, we can give you an EpiPen. Yeah. But we can't prescribe, and that's, that's a big sticking point in practice as well. 
Um, but at the moment, like from my experience, everyone seems to be getting over it okay. You sort of work it out with your junior doctor colleagues and stuff. So it's, it's not really that big of a hindrance to practice as you think it might be. Uh, what's the best way to go about getting PA shadowing experience? Uh, in terms of for myself, because I already worked in a clinical setting, I knew one of the PAs that worked in uh, emergency department. And luckily for my hospital, we did like every everyone in our department got to do like half a day following like an A&E doctor or someone. And I just asked if I could follow the PA. So through that, and then just, you don't necessarily need shadowing experience of a PA. It could be anyone of a clinical setting. And I think uh, to get an even deeper understanding is speak to current uh, PA students, stuff like YouTube, Instagram, there's a lot of pages at the moment that are, they're able to give you free help. They're willing to give you help. So I think just do that, but there's, uh, just because of, I think with COVID at the moment, there are a lot of restrictions at the moment in terms of hospital and work experience. So just try and get any experience, clinical, non-clinical, but just a caring setting, I think, and that will help you. If you, if you're really, you can, no. sorry, I was just going to say, if you're really, really set on the fact that you want PA um, shadowing experience, LinkedIn is a great place to start. Um, literally just type in physician associate and start messaging people who are local to you and don't be afraid if people say no um, say like do you have any colleagues that might be able to take me on and be that really annoying person because that's what's going to get you somewhere um, also finding a PA mentor is a really good idea so someone who um, is out there in the world um, has their established career is able to point you towards people who might be more helpful um, that's usually quite helpful. Um, getting in touch with PA students at your current university, at the university that's local to you, because they'll have knowledge of PAs in practice or doctors in practice who are willing to have students and are really enthusiastic. Um, that's usually what I, I don't have any shadowing experience of a PA. Um, I had very minimal shadowing experience of doctors, um, but I've come out the other end fine. So there's no reason why you cannot. Um, yeah, I think m m the main part is just whatever setting you're doing your work in. So you could be like a barrister or whatever your job is. You just need to uh, mention the transferable skills and how they can relate to a PA and how a PA will use them in their everyday day to day tasks. So it's not necessarily you need to follow or shadow a PA. It's just anything you've done in the past or you're going to do how you can transfer those skills that you've learned onto the PA setting. Yeah, absolutely. And we're all reachable um, on all social media. So my my Instagram handle is at the the, the CPA. So T-H-E-D-E-S-I-P-A. Um, and then I'll let these two share their handles if they want to. Uh, one last question, I think, is there's a question on that. Oh, it says, so, sorry, the sorry. Will the hospital we do our placements that be chosen by uni or I think it depends on the university. I think mine, they've got like their own criteria that they use to uh, decide the uh, placement site. So I think for us is it can't be more, no longer than 90 minutes. And then if you have any special needs or you let them know beforehand. But like I know for my undergrad it was a bit different, like where we chose the three placement sites and they just allocated it. But I think it depends per university. So I know for Bradford is they allocate them. I'm not too sure on Newcastle, so maybe one of these can. Most universities um, have partnerships with with hospital trusts already, and you're expected to go to the hospitals that they give you. Um, because PA places are in short, so short supply, PA funding is in such short, short supply, um, it's it's wherever you're allocated you go for the most part obviously there is some flexibility in this if there is a place at another another hospital you can negotiate it um or another gp practice but it's usually um ones that the university has already got links with um i think there are still questions in the chat so i'm just going to have a quick um read through this sorry so what would you suggest for how much detail to write up revise for a 1A condition compared to, for example, a 2A, 2B condition? I'm guessing the pain covers more 1A conditions. So the pain actually covers mostly 1A, 1B conditions, although 
I was personally surprised at how many 2A, 2B conditions came up in my exams just now. Um, and I don't know if that was just because of how many questions there were that it just, that, that the questions that were more rare, the rarer conditions just sort of popped up in my face. Um, but I would recommend that you go into enough detail for 1A, 1B uh, conditions that can explain the etiology, so why the condition happens, the um, specific risk factors that cause you to, that could put you at more risk of this um, condition, the signs and symptoms, um, the actual pathophysiology, so what is it that causes the symptoms that you have, um, the investigations that you do for that condition, the treatment that you do for that condition, and then the prognosis for that condition. Um, within my study group, we did that for all of the conditions, regardless of 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. Um, for 2B conditions, when I revised them, um, and 2A conditions, I really only learned the first line um, for, for most things. So the first line investigation, the first line management, so what's the first drug I would try for this condition? Um, and what is the most classic picture? Um, of, of a person who's going to present to me looking with that condition um, but a lot of people go into the same amount of detail for everything or some people go into very little detail for 2B but this is just what I found comfortable um, it also meant that I was giving the same amount of time to every condition uh, which was really important to me uh, to make sure I actually understood what the 2A and 2B as well otherwise I would think I would just fall off the radar with them um, Diana, do you want to talk about how much detail you've been going into with stuff? Um, I think that pretty much what you've done as well. I think with me, um, for every condition, I had a little doc um, and it had like um, the definition, the risk factor, the signs, symptoms, the examinations I would do and what I would like, you know, what, what I would find if I was to do those examinations on that patient. Um, and then um, and how how I would treat and manage that. Um, I think even with for, even with two Bs, I did do that. But I think, you know, the night before the exam, I didn't even look look at that. I think when you make the notes, it's probably the only time you'll be covering the two Bs. Um, and then you'll see two Bs and two As like when you're on the board and stuff like that. And you will pick up, you'll absorb the in information. So you probably wouldn't want to go back and look at that again. But one A's and one one B's, yeah, it's probably best you know your treatment and management as well, um, as well as you know ad identifying the, the diagnosis. Um, someone's just asked, what's a one A, one B, two A, two B condition? So um, these are conditions uh, mapped by the matrix. So we have a list of conditions that we're expected to know, um, set out by the Faculty of Physician Associates. Um, it's available on their website if you want to have a look. It's um, the Faculty of Physician Associates at the Royal College of Physicians. If you just write FPA matrix, it's like the first thing that comes up or something. Um, it's it's basically telling you how much detail you need to know about it. It's a little bit confusing to understand what is 1A, what's 1B, etc. But essentially, it's about whether you should be able to diagnose it in the, like with the resources that you have and whether you should be able to manage it with the resources that you have. Um, and depending on whether it's a yes or a no to both of those questions, depends if it's a 1A or, or a 2B um, and everything in between. It's a little bit blurry in, in actual practice. It's, it doesn't actually work like that. Um, from my experience, it's just you know everything or you don't know anything. Um, but that's that's what the matrix says. Um, so, and that's probably why I didn't really pay that much attention to whether it was 1A, 1B, 2A, 2B. Um, but yeah, that's that. Someone's asked, uh, what were the best resources that you found for uh, year one and year two? So, Diana, do you want to talk about what you found useful? Um, resources wise, um, there's loads of websites, but I think my main go to resource was um, NICE guidelines. So anything that you do, um, always just make sure that your treatment and your management is um, keeping in line with what the NICE is saying. Um, this um, with asthma management, things like that, there's actually multiple different managements. So there's NICE guidelines um, and then there's the BTS, the, I think it's the British Thoracic Society guidelines. So you might want to just, you know, read over it, but I would probably stick to the NICE guidelines because I think that's what the nationals um, advice advises that we do. Um, so yeah, NICE is my main go-to um, 
resource. I used osmosis. I really enjoy using osmosis. Um, I am someone who likes to know the physiology. Um, I like to understand why things happen, and then I can kind of figure out if this happens, then what's what's bound to happen after that. So I like to have like a, a, a method in my head to kind of figure out what this patient now at risk of because they've got this. Um, so I really like my physiology. So for physiology, um, for the physiology element, I used osmosis, but it is a US based um, resource. So it's um, what do you call the treatment and the management is not um, the nice guideline kind of um, guideline. Um, I used past medicine to practice questions, but I think there's uh, different people use different resources. I used past medicine. Um, patient info um, is quite nice as well. Um, but yeah, nice guidelines and um, past medicine was my go-to resources. Um, I think also for like uh, uh, practical elements, such as like how to take a blood pressure, ECG stuff like that. Uh, zero to finals is good because it gives you like a video demonstration. Or the yeah. websites that I've started using are Geeky Medics. Uh, there's a YouTube channel. Uh, the name is a bit complicated, so I won't try to say it. But I will try to see if we can link it on our Instagram or something. But uh, that's really good. It just depends on what kind of learner you are and what's best for you. But there's a whole range of sources that your university and other PA students will give to you. I think at the moment, uh, just don't worry about this uh, exam stress. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I would, I would second all of that. Um, I think we'll probably make a blog post about with our top 10 resources um, and put everything in one place and upload it onto the website in the next couple of weeks. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I second most of what everyone else has said. I really liked, um, I really like nice guidelines, but I find them really difficult to understand and like read like the functionality of the actual website is very difficult to navigate um so i used bite medicine a lot which also has a question bank um i used geeky medics a lot um mainly because one of the guys who vets all of the examinations and stuff was one of our lecturers at placement um and then um i liked patient.info a lot for trying to understand really complicated topics really simply because they have they usually have like a a patient one and a professional one and if you read the patient one everything's given to you in plain text um and i find it difficult to understand things when everything's in medical jargon and i don't think like that so i think with nice guidelines you have to there's two nice websites there's the nice website and then there's the nice cks mm -hmm. it's the nice cks because that's got not got the flow charts in that you have to click on the different pathways so the cks nice cks is the better version that yeah. I used. Someone yeah. also mentioned how do you prepare for progress tests. So at Bradford, for example, we cover a system depending on how big the system is. We cover it within that time frame, and then we have an exam at the end of it. So it's my second week of uni. I've got an exam in two weeks' time for the cardiovascular. So currently in my like friend group, we've got about eight of us. So all the cardiovascular conditions, regardless of one A, one B, we've just distributed the conditions. And what we're going to do is maybe next week, we're just going to uh, teach it others, for example, that anyone needs it and share our notes to each other. So that way we're not all uh, cramming everything in. And, and one of the good ways to t learn is to teach others. So that's how we're doing it. I'm making my own notes as well. So I'm like the signs and symptoms, what the definition of the condition is, uh, risk factors, uh, first line of management, second line of management, investigation, first, second, what's the gold standard? So I'm trying to keep it brief at the moment and see what, how, what's basically for our end of unit test is like 15 SBA questions. I want to see what kind of questions they'll ask and how in depth I need to go in. And then from there, I will change or adapt my learning style if need being. But that's how we do it at Bradford. But other unis might not do end of topic tests. They might just do it towards the end or in their exam period. So it just depends on the university on what your learning style is and how you prefer to learn or what's the best way for you to learn. But that's how I do mine. Trial and error. I'm telling you this now, trial and error. Try out as many techniques as you can. And if they don't work for you, they don't work, you move on to something that does. Um, but like I said, if something doesn't work, move on and try something different. Um, and try, try and practice that technique as early on in your years as you can, because 
you don't want to be trying this out at revision, which is what I did for my final exams. Um, try try revise revising um, as early as you can. Um, and try loads of different techniques and see what happens. Um, I've just reposted the feedback link. Um, I don't think any more questions have come through. Uh, I'll just double check. Sorry, Pooja, there was just one question. Um, I think it's Neve. Um, that's just messaged that and she's still online. So <laughs> I thought I'll just answer that. Um, so why I chose PA over cardiac physiology, I think it's Predominantly because um, I didn't, I couldn't see myself just working, you know, just in the cardiac unit, just, you know, looking at ECGs. And I felt like I was getting quite annoyed that I was just, you know, um, seeing that, telling the doctors that this patient has a second degree AV block, but not being able to then treat it. Um, so it was just like, well, I could, you know, I want to treat it too. I want to be part of the management. Um, I really did enjoy it. I just didn't see myself doing it for the rest of my life. And I've, I've always been quite interested in neuro as well. So this um, call, um, PA kind of allows me to kind of, if if I didn't enjoy neuro, I could then go back to cardiac and I've got that baseline understanding of cardiac. Um, but yeah, that's why I chose um, PA over cardiac physiology. Sorry, I was just scrolling back through the chat. I've, I've literally missed like loads of stuff. Um, I, think, I think that's all of the questions now. Um, if Ooh. anyone has, yes. Sorry, I was just about to say, um, it might also be worth asking the uni. Um, so I'm speaking from my personal experience. I did really well for my Christmas exams, but I actually screwed up my proper um, initial SBAs. And I wasn't, I never assumed um, I would screw up, um, I would fail the first set of SBAs. So I never really asked, asked the uni about what are the research options and what can they offer me. So I, um, when I did re um, fail the um, SBAs, um, at Newcastle Uni, you get um, one chance to reset the exam and that's it. Um, but other unis does offer it, um, they do offer more than one chance. And um, it was down to me whether I want to reset the exam this year or if I should sit as an external candidate, candidate next year. Um, but I wasn't aware of that. I never really thought that far ahead. And I've never failed in any of my exams in my degree or in, in A levels or GCCs or anything like that. So it's not something that I thought about, um, but that's probably something that it's probably a discussion discussion that you can have with your module leader or anything. You know, what happens if you if you did fail in DOSCE or if you did fail the SBAs. Um, but yeah, that's something to consider. And I think, yeah, I was quite shook with my results. So, um, and I think that's, mainly because I kind of burned out. I didn't really pay as much as, as much attention as I should have. Um, but I've learned and I'm into my second year now. So yeah, just you know, ask you, um, uni what their options are if you do have to reset an exam. If anyone has any other questions regarding the application process, because I'm like a first year student, just doing it, uh, you could message me on Insta, for example, I think we might link it, but it's ikram underscore underscore azad. But we'll, yeah, so just message me and then hopefully I can answer some questions. If not, I'll signpost you to other colleagues that will have more information. Any other questions before we end the webinar? Or any suggestions for what you need maybe for next time or anything that you need more information on or any clearance on? Yeah, we'll list uh, our social handles below. I don't use Twitter much. It's, <laughs> I don't even use social media much, but I'll try my best. Uh, my, my Twitter and my Instagram are the same. So yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm just going to double check what my Insta ID is because Mm, yep, it is just double nine. Thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I hope that this was useful to you guys. Um, I hope it was useful. Uh, I think we've talked loads and loads. And thank you so much for bearing with us and um, like giving up like ages of your evening. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to reach out. Um, that's our feedback link. We're always reachable through our email as well. So if you if you email Future Frontline, um, it's info at futurefrontline.co.uk. Um, 
and and one of us will get back to you um but yeah hope you all have a good evening bye bye now and all the best ah, gosh bye bye oh, it's just us three now <laughs>